Good afternoon and welcome to the Farming in the Palm of Your Hand webinar. My name is Cassie Turk and I'm the Project Manager for Agritech Cornwall at Rockingstead Research. Thank you for joining the webinar. So I'm sure you're aware there are a wealth of tools and applications that today's farmer and growers can utilise from their smartphone, tablet and farm computer. The challenge all of these tools face and try to resolve is how to minimise the amount of data that farmers need to input while providing useful and compliant and accurate outputs to assist farmers and growers to make viable decisions. Within this webinar, we have brought together five of these database programs to discuss how they translated data from figures to farm specific information to your fingertips. This research is supported by Agritech Cornwall, which is a four year initiative to increase research and development and innovation in the agritech sector in Cornwall and the Isle of Scilly. Part funded by the European Regional Development Fund, the project is led by Duchy College Rural Business School in partnership with leading research institutions, the Universities of Exeter, Plymouth, and Rothamsted Research, as well as the Cornwall Development Company. We will be having a Q&A session at the end of each presentation, and then a panel session at the end of the webinar for any unanswered queries or, mo or more generalised questions. So please enter your questions in the Q&A function and we will try to get to as many as possible. We will produce a Q&A document after the event for delegates so that we can answer all of the queries posted. We're keen to find out about what sectors our delegates are representing today. So if you could complete the following poll, we would be very grateful. There will be other, some other polls throughout the event for you to engage with. The poll is now open. We are asking what sector you're from. Are you a farmer, grower, advisor, consultant, agronomist, interested individual, or an SME or from the industry? We we'll just give you a couple more minutes to complete that. Thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to introduce Rob Dunn from Rothamsted Research and Becky Wilson from Duchy College, who are here to talk about the Farm Crap App Pro. Hi there, are we uh, getting a slide up? Yeah, I'm sure it's just coming. the poll knocked it out just give me a second <laughs> okay so yeah we're just waiting for the presentation to load um i think while we're waiting for that i'll just say two things first is i'd like to say thank you to kirsty for organizing this <laughs> her driving it it wouldn't have happened i'm sure um and the second thing is i've somehow managed to catch cold in the last few days so at some point i'll have to mute myself and blow my nose um, so i apologize <laughs> for that before we start um, so yeah, so this is the Farm Crap App. Um, it's a collaboration between Rothamsted and Duchy, um, and funded by the ERDF. Um, if we go on to the next slide, please. So <clears throat> get the bad news out of the way first. Um, it was in the news not too long ago that English rivers have been quite badly polluted, um, not just from agriculture, but from various other industries as well. Um, Wales and Scotland aren't quite so bad as England, but agriculture seems to be playing a, a, a predominant role in some of the pollution incidents that are going on. So if we could have a, the next slide, please. This is just an example uh, of a river that's local to Northwick, where I work. Um, it's the River Tor, it's in the <coughs> North Devon catchment. And there were seven incidents recorded in the time period when this was made. Um, and I've said there were four from agriculture, I've made a mistake there, there's three from agriculture. Um, and some of those are nutrient management uh, issues and problems. So yeah, so in terms of the impact of agriculture on rivers, which obviously nobody really owns, but everybody gains the benefits from, I think there are probably things that we can do that 
would reduce the incidence of pollution going into these rivers. Um, the good news is that the CRAP app can help farmers to uh, make decisions actually in the field when they're doing some of their muck spreading in particular. Um, that will help reduce the incidence of pollution into local rivers. So if we go on to the next slide, please. So the Farm Crap app, it's a free app. You can download it. This is just an example from the Google Play Store. You can also download it from the um, Apple App Store. And like it says there, it says it's free. You don't have to pay for this at all. Um, <clears throat> and if we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, just some of the features of the crap app. It's, uh, it's free to use, and no signal required. So once you've downloaded the app, you don't actually have to have a signal to make it work. So that has poor reception, there's not a problem to use it. Easy to use, nice and easy to actually locate your farm and mark out fields that you're interested in working with. It allows you to input data from previous crops and your expectations for the upcoming crop. Um, it gives an assessment, which is one of the unique features of the, of the app, gives an assessment of how much slurry or muck you're spreading and, and gives nutrients uh, that you're spreading within that muck um, and compares that to what is expected for, for the crop. And then it advises on any extra fertilizer, like fertilizer that you'd have to um, apply to make sure that your crops are getting what they need. And all of the agronomy is based on the RB209 fertilizer recommendations. So there's a good agronomy base, uh, depending on, you know, that's actually working behind the scenes to make sure that your crops are actually getting what they need. Uh, so I'm just going to do a quick worked example just to show the, the basic uh, running of the app. So if we go to the next slide, please. Like I say, it's very easy to locate your farm. It gives you a little blue dot where you are. Obviously, if you don't have a signal, then you just have to zoom in and out of the map to try and find yourself and the farm that well the field that i'm going to talk about is the one that's just slightly northwest of where the blue dot is the blue dot is my house uh, and the field that i'm talking about is the one with a little tree just to the sort of 12 o'clock position below the, the block of woodland so if we go on to the next slide please uh, there's a, a feature where you can draw around your field obviously it's called your field here but you can give it any name you like and if we go on to the next slide, please. It's just an example, really, because it was a bit of an odd shape. That it's quite easy to actually plot around the edge of the field, um, irrespective of the, the sort of little ins and outs that the edges might have. And it gives you an estimate of the area that your field has. So this one is 2.12 hectares. And just at the bottom of there, it says soil details. So if we go on to the next slide, please. You can input some of your details local to your farm. So you can put in soil type, and there are, I think there are 12 different soil types you can use. The one that's local to here is a heavy clay, so that's what I put in. Uh, it asks whether or not you apply manures, and I've said yes. If you have any uh, soil chemistry data, you can actually put them into the app here. Uh, rather than just having uh, estimates, you can actually use your own data. It gives you your soil nitrogen supply, it basically gets that from your location on the map. And if we go to the next slide, please. It gives you a chance to put in what you've previously grown. So I've said this is in the, our example here, it's a forage crop, just grown silage. Um, and I grew grass obviously a year ago. And then the new crop, <clears throat> so I've chosen maize, um, and it gives you crop requirements at the bottom there. So it's saying that we need 20 kilos per hectare of nitrogen, 55 of P2O5, and 145 of K2O. Uh, if you go on to the next slide, please. You can then add a uh, spreading event. So I'm saying that I've spread cattle slurry, and obviously it's May, so I've done this in the spring, and I put the end of April down as a, as a date. And I've said that it's a 2% um, thin soup type of slurry. And you can put down different types of uh, applicators. So I've said I've used a splash plate. And then it gives you a photograph. And there's a library of photographs within the app that you can make comparisons to. So if I was to go out into the field and start spreading, after the first spread, I could stop the tractor, get out, and take a photograph with a camera on the, on the telephone. 
and then compare it to the uh, photographs within the app. So go to the next slide, please. So here, <clears throat> I've imagined to, well, you can imagine I've compared the spreading of the slurry in the field. And I said that this photo is the, the nearest match to what I've actually spread in the field. And it's given me a value of 50 cubic meters per hectare. And down below that, it gives the, the amount of nutrients that are coming from your slurry that are crop available. So the 36 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, P25 is 30, K12 is 85. And I don't need to remember what the estimate, what the recommended rates were for the crop because it tells me again. So it's there saying that nitrogen is 20. <clears throat> so in this instance, I've actually started spreading too much slurry. And because I've done this in the field, actually, as I'm doing the spreading, I can nip back the uh, the application rate. Uh, instead of spreading 36 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, I can nip it back down to what the crop requires. And in that way, if I was a farmer, I'd be gaining because I wouldn't be spreading too much um, fertilizer on the field uh, over and above what the crop actually requires. But also the environment gains because the less um, fertilizer there is there, the less incidents there are of pollutants going into the rivers. Uh, so if we go on to the next slide, please. So there I've said that if I trim it back to something like the picture and it comes out as 27 meters cubed, it gives me the uh, amount of nitrogen in the manure is 19, which is close to 20. Um, and then I would actually be able to add extra P and K in bagged form uh, to make sure that the crop is actually getting where it requires. But I wouldn't necessarily have to add that at that time. I could do that when I was drilling the seed. Um, so in a way, we've I've gained far, made sure that my resource is being used properly and effectively, and I'm not over applying and the environment gains because we're not likely to get as many pollution incidents if you're using less uh, fertilizer in the form of this slurry being applied uh, before I plowed up the field and planted my maize. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Becky at this point, and she's going to talk about a case study um, instead of the um, imaginative, imaginative um, you know, not real uh, example that I've just gone through. This is a real farm that she's going to talk about. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, Sophie, could we go on to the next slide, please? Um, so, yeah, Rob's given a really good uh, introduction and understanding of how the crap app works. I suppose a couple of things I'd just like to add in terms of the fact that the crap app has really been designed in a really iterative way. So, uh, we, you know, back, and it's been through various phases of development. So, you might have noticed at the beginning it was saying Farm Crap App Pro. Um, you know, this, this project has, has sort of evolved and moved on from the first, uh, the first version of the app back in 2000 and 2012 13, which was very much an awareness raising tool. It was designed to help farmers value and understand, um, you know, the nutrient content and the nutritive value of the organic manures and slurries and to treat them as a resource rather than see them as a waste that they had to get rid of. And as that process has evolved and as the app has developed, then farmers have really appreciated it and seen the value of it. And so we've tried to make the app do more and more and become more of a decision support tool and something that farmers can use out in the field to help them make better decisions rather than just that initial phase, which was looking at that sort of raising awareness of the benefit and the value of manures and slurries that have back to the farm, both in terms of improved environmental performance, improved economic performance and improved soil health. So we work with a few farmers on this, and this is one of the farmers that we that um, you know that has been using the app. As I said, it's an iterative process. So we have a group of farmers that have been working with us since the beginning uh, in terms of trialing different versions of the app and telling us what we need to do in terms of making it as user friendly as possible. Um, and sometimes we could they can take a little bit little bit of convincing. So this was a um, uh, was was a farm where they've got two silage fields um, which both had a sort of target yield of between five and seven tons of dry matter, which are cut four times for silage. And so we set down a challenge at this point, and we said, right, you manage one of the fields uh, in the way that you would traditionally manage it in terms of applying what you normally apply, and we'll manage the other field using the crap app. And we'll see what happens. And so both fields have been managed, as I say, both fields are on the same soil type, same crop, same length of lay and all the rest of it. Um, both fields had slurry over the winter and then also had, uh, you know, an initial dressing of 50 kilos per hectare of nitrogen in the spring before first cut. 
After each silage cut, each field had an application of slurry um, that was about 22 cubic meters per hectare, it's about 2,000 gallons an acre. Um, the crap up field, because we planned the applications through the crap up and we saw it needed no extra nitrogen, a bit like Rob had already shown, it was there in terms of, it for, of its fertilizer requirements. So we didn't put anything else on. The farmer traditionally would have applied um, another, uh, an additional nitrogen application after second cut. So they went ahead and did that. And then after each cut, we cut quadrats and we assessed the yield difference. And we found that there was no difference in yield. So that extra nitrogen had not actually resulted in uh, increased dry matter or increased forage production, but actually had still been a, an economic and an environmental cost back to that farmer. So, you know, we use this as a real example just to say, well, you know, we can we can stand here and we can talk about all the benefits, but actually, can we use the app and can we use these sort of decision support deals to actually change behavior and actually start to provide that science and provide that research in a way which is, you know, genuinely useful to farmers, which is the underlying ethos of the app. Thanks, Sophie. Um, so the other really interesting thing from this is that the farmer, you know, the observations that came back from the farmer is that actually, you know, this is something that they will continue to do. Um, and the other benefits they were finding was they were actually finding that in the field that had less fertilizer applied to it, they were also seeing increased clover content, which has benefits in terms of improved nutrient uh, nutrient content of the forage. Thank you. So just to conclude, really, um, can we have the next slide, Sophie? Thanks. Um, just to conclude, um, you know, we have huge amounts of opportunities in terms of manure management. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what sort of environmental parameter we're looking at, whether it be water quality, air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, any of those sort of things. Improved nutrient management is a win on all of those. And from a farmer's point of view, improved nutrient management and integration of manure and fertilizer applications has massive benefits in terms of to the farmer's bottom line. This current tool, so RB209, has been around for years. We have various other nutrient management planning opportunities and, and tools that are out there, but our research showed at the beginning that they were currently underutilized. So what we tried to do was try and talk to farmers and understand why they weren't using the current tools that were there and really try to develop something that, you know, did what they needed it to do. And that's really where it's come in terms of being able to be used in the field, as Rob said, to make those quick decisions. It's also in a two-phased approach. So the calculator allows you to take a quick account of what's going on with an individual application. And then the you can set up all of your field records and set up all of your farms to create a tool that actually can do that sort of farm and field level planning for you. But the crap app really takes that information out to the farmer in the field where they can use it. And as I say, we'd really encourage anybody who hasn't downloaded it or hasn't used it to have a go and tell us what you think, because that iterative process hasn't finished. We will continue as they were continuing to build on feedback. So thank you very much. So, um, yeah, we've had a few questions come in over, uh, over your wonderful presentation. Thank you both. Um, so the first one is, will the CRAP app get the functionality to link to the RPA site for the farm so that field data can be input automatically? Yeah, I mean, this is something that we've, it's, it's really interesting when we start talking about the mapping function, because the original, the original version of the app didn't have that mapping function within it. And certainly when we went out and did feedback with, with farmers, and it was specifically actually our young farmer groups that we were working with and some of our students who said that that ability to map was really, really important and the ability to, you know, not just log, log the field. So it's also from the, from the developer's point of view, something that's been quite a headache in terms of getting that to a point where it's usable and user friendly. And certainly there are lots of other data sources that we can use to do that so we could as i say use like the rba rpas uh, you know uh, referencing system and all those sort of things which means that for things like when we're trying to adhere with compliance and risk maps and all those sort of things it should work seamlessly it's it's certainly something that we would we would look at for the future we're still trying to keep um uh, what we what we really want to do is we want to try and make sure that it's a genuinely useful tool for farmers. So again, trying to link up with with RPA databases and environment agency databases and all the rest of it. We want to make sure that if that if that were a development that we were going to do, that it would still allow the farmer to to be 
uh, to be able to put in what they were actually doing in terms of applications without any fear of any repercussions or any of that sort of thing. Because certainly, you know, we've had discussions in the past about about how we link that up. And as I say, we want it to be, um, you know, to be genuinely useful. But certainly, it's something that that we could that we could look at in the future. And if that makes if that makes the process of logging people's farms and fields an easier thing, then certainly that gets a thumbs up from me because it hope, helps uh, improve usability. Great. Uh, this next question is, is there any input in terms of met data, um, i.e. Protected, uh, predicted potential upcoming weather events? So the weather data, the weather data that's currently in there just feeds into um, there's a location data and climate data that helps to um, sort out the soil nitrogen supply. It's not currently linked to uh, to any weather data in terms of um, in terms of looking at risk factors, both in terms of you know ammonia or nitrous oxide or any of those sort of things. Um, it's certainly a future development that we could put in um, in terms of making even better use because obviously the figures that are in there currently um, they take into account seasonality they take into account soil conditions and they take into account existing soil uh, soil tests and soil analysis but certainly that weather data would add a whole a whole new level of um, of looking at maximizing the benefits and being able to optimize the amount of nutrient that's sat within that manure that's that's crop available so certainly something to look at for the future mm -hmm. Uh, can the outputs from this be used as evidence for NVZ um, compliance? So NVZ is a, is a real interesting one. And I think we were probably, we were, I was probably slightly over ambitious uh, and maybe a little bit naive at the start when we started this process in terms of what we could, uh, what we could get it to do. Um, I think the balancing act is always, um, is always with, with maintaining that simplicity of user interface and being able to demonstrate compliance. And so currently um, the app will provide some of the information that you need to do your NVZ, NVZ paperwork. It doesn't do all of it. Um, because again, we're still trying to battle with that with that ability to collect that information in a way which is which is user friendly. The other thing to sort of think about is that a lot of that information. So in terms of in terms of NVZ paperwork, it collects your field your field your field application your field spreading data, which can be used for that. But it doesn't take doesn't do the rest of the stuff in terms of NMAXs and all the rest of it. Because again, if we go back to the to the sort of uh, the reason why we created the app in the way that you could do it in the field is the fact that you don't need to be putting that information in around calculating Nmaxes and livestock numbers in the field. There's various bits of that that, that, it, that it does do in terms of documenting those spreading events, but the rest of the paperwork that needs to go with MVZs can be done in, in the office. Um, and so certainly the, the CRAP app facilitates that, that field record part of it very well, but the wider paperwork, as I say, it doesn't do currently on its version. Uh, we've got quite a few more. Uh, is it possible to alter the yield goal within the app? Yes, yeah. So it is it is currently both in terms of within your uh, within a grassland crop and also with some of the arable crops as well. If you are looking because um, obviously the figures that RB209 are based on uh, are based on an average yield. If you want to change that, you can do that. And it's also asking if the photos um, also include uh, working with muck as well as slurries. Yep, so we've got a huge different range of a library of different uh, different organic manures. So there's cattle slurry, there's pig slurry, there's poultry manure, there's uh, straw-based FYM, which comes from cattle. Um, so there's, you know, we had lots of fun doing lots of pictures uh, with different types of manures. So they're all within there, it's not just slurry. And interestingly, on the slurry one, you can also see what it looks like if you were applying it using a splash plate or if you were applying it using uh, a dribble bar as well. Yeah, and there's also a customizable part of that. So if it's not if you're if what you're spreading is not on the list, then you can add in basically what you're spreading. We've got compost in there as well, actually. Compost mm -hmm. is in there. Um, but you're right, Rob. And as I say, you know, you can also put in your own images. So again, when you go and spread, you can take a picture and it will save it with that spreading event so that then you can start to build up your own library. Um, so we've all we've been asked how much time has been needed to convince how many farmers. So I think that's asking. How many um, downloads have we had and how long has this been going on? And um, obviously Farm Crap App has been um, gone through different iterations. Um, so maybe you could give us an idea of uh, farmer uptake. 
Yeah, so um, as, as I said, as I said during my part of the presentation, um, the initial idea for this uh, was developed back in 2012. But this current version, um, we were uh, fortunate to get Agritech Cornwall funding to develop this this latest version. And one of the one of the key functions within this latest version is to develop a sharing option so that contractors and uh, consultants can use it as a seamless way to, to transfer information from the farmer uh, to, the, to them and also for contractors who are out spreading to be able to document the benefits of that. In terms of number of downloads, uh, we're on about two and a half thousand downloads uh, of, of the current version. Um, so, you know, we had a, we had a beta version. Um, so we had we had the original awareness raising version, which did really well. And then, as I say, we st you know, the, the, the feedback from farmers was it's brilliant, but it would be even better if it did X, Y and Z. And so that's you know, the doing the X, Y and Z is what we've delivered and well, what we've developed. And we're, we're continuing to develop through this next version of it so that we've still got that very simple awareness raising tool function. But then you can actually take that and use that in much more detail in terms of providing your field records. Um, so, yeah, in terms of farmer uptake, it's been it's been good. Um, I think obviously, uh, you know, it, we get interesting balances in terms of, um, you know, it is, does tend to be quite livestock focused because obviously we're dealing with organic manures, but we have had, um, you know, we have had suggestions from, from farmers who are using a range of other organic materials um, that aren't just manures and slurries and how we incorporate those into it as well. Um, I think, you know, we try and stay quite, quite true to its focus in terms of that, you know, being able to help, uh, you know, help farmers appreciate the, the economic and the environmental benefit that comes from using manures um, and how to how we can do that in a way which helps them make decisions and help make the most of the of the materials that they've got. Um, so definitely there are there are lots of opportunities for future future developments, um, you know, that hopefully would help improve, you know, help uptake in terms of more numbers of farmers using it. But we just need to make sure that we're continuing to keep it genuinely useful uh, and, and that easy, easy to use interface. Otherwise, we've, we risk the issue of falling into the trap that some other nutrient management planning tools are, is that they're fantastic and they do everything, but nobody uses them. Um, and we've also got one last one, which is in uh, your example, Becky, in the case study, um, apart from yield, were any protein levels obtained? Yeah, so this, the samples went off for analysis. I haven't got the results back yet, actually. Um, but yeah, we sent, the, we sent the forage samples off for analysis, both uh, in, to look at the nutritional quality of it as well. Okay. Um, and there's a couple of general questions here, um, just to reassure uh, delegates that this event is um, being recorded and will be available after. If you follow the original registration um, uh, details, then you'll um, be led through to the recording so you can view actual leisure. So um, I'd like to say a big thank you to Becky and Rob, um, and we are just going to launch a poll now. Um, just to find out uh, how many of you have um, used the CRAP app as a decision support tool. Um, so my colleague Gareth is just going to post that poll up. Um, as I said, I'd um, like to thank uh, Becky and Rob for that great introduction to, um, uh, to the CRAP app Pro. Um, also, you can continue to post your um, questions uh, in the Q&A function for um, Becky and Rob. Uh, we will um, return to uh, them at the end in the panel event. If you can just put in your question, if it's um, for a, presentator, a presentation that's already gone, um, perhaps just um, the title, so crap app, followed by your question, so that we know which, um, which presentation it refers to. That would be really helpful. So um, I think we are probably there with that poll. Thank you very much for taking part in that. Um, I'd like to now introduce um, Laura Crook um, from Rothamsted Research. Um, she's going to be joining us to talk about the Crop Protect um, project and, and tool. Um, so and Laura is uh, driving her own presentation, so hopefully pass over to her. And then we will follow um, her presentation again with a short Q&A session. So please remember to post your questions um, into the Q&A function for Laura, and we will, um, we will address those after her talk. Yep, okay, brilliant, thank you. Hopefully, 
presentation will appear in a moment. Okay, hopefully that's worked and now people can see my presentation. Um, yeah, so um, my name is Laura Crook and I'm a research technician at Bottomstead Research, um, mainly um, investigating um, resistant black grass, but then since the summer of 2019, I also um, been managing the Crop Protect um, app and website. Um, and so this is the mission statement from uh, Crop Protect. And I thought that this best describes I'm oh, sorry, I don't know why it's not working. <laughs> There we go. Um, yeah, apologies. Um, so this is a mission statement from uh, Crop Protect, and I thought this best described um, what our aim is. Um, and so we're wanting to provide you, the farmers and agronomists, um, with the information that you require, um, details on management, and then other control methods, um, such as um, cultural. And so just to show um, what our impact of uh, Crop Protect is so far, um, we have over a thousand users that have um, uh, downloaded and are using a, a free account. And I'll, I'll explain what that means um, a bit later on. Um, we also uh, use social media to um, communicate um, a lot of what we're doing as well. And we have we use that as Twitter and we have over 1,200 um, followers. Um, Rothamsted uh, aims to be an independent uh, organisation and so we keep that with Crop Protect. We have no companies that are sponsoring our, our information um, and we include information that comes from other sources as well, which you'll see um, as we're going through. Um, of course, we're always ensuring that the information is current and up to date. Um, and then after taking it on um, last summer, we wanted to try and make some improvements to it. So we have added one or two, um, you know, some new features have been added. Um, and then after um, quite a major software update that was required, um, certainly for the app, um, this uh, the app was relaunched um, just before and during CropTech um, in November 2019. Um, so these are just the, I'll just show you the landing pages of what happened you know, if you go onto the website um, uh, or if you download the app. And so both contain the same information. Um, so, so that suits different users' preferences depending on whether you want to look at it from your computer at home or whether you're out and about and you know, want to look at your phone from your pocket and look something up. And um, the app is available to download from Apple, the Apple Store, or Google Play, or wherever you download your, your apps from. Um, so as you can see, there's kind of um, different, uh, different sections that are on both the website and the app. Um, we have a crop section, um, which is listing uh, the main crops um, that we grow um, in the UK. And then each type of pest um, has its own tab um, and the common pests that are found for UK crops um, are listed alphabetically. So we have insect pests, we have weeds, and we have diseases. And so I'm just gonna take you through an example of what the species information looks like. Um, I've just chosen um, Septoria um, and this, these next few um, uh, screenshots are actually from the app because um, I found it was a bit clearer to, to see a picture and see what, 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 to show you what was, what, what we happens with it. Um, so as you can see, we've got a picture at the top 
um, that's on all the species. There's a picture right at the top, so you're able to easily see. Um, you know, it gives, it gives you some identification. And then there's a description um, as well of, of what, what it looks like in the field. So, um, see, you know, this is the damage that you could see caused by septoria, or if it was an insect, it might be, you know, some, some key characteristics to look out for, um, maybe what size it is, that sort of thing. Um, weeds, you know, maybe a description and what, you know, the flowering, um, you know, colour the flower would be and that sort of thing. Um, so that's... Um, yeah. And then, as you can see, um, you have this I have this issue um, button. And so this relates to the free account that I was talking about before. So when people um, download, you can just look at the website and the app um, just for free, just look at the information. But if you want to sign up for a, a free account, then you can. Um, it just puts in your location. You can put a bit of information about where, you know, what crops you're growing. And then as you're going through, if you can identify um, uh, which um, species problems you have an issue with. Um, and so then you can see what, what you have on your farm. Um, so as you can see, um, pesticides are mentioned when it comes through to the, the management. Um, and that is because they are part of the, the toolkit of crop protection. Um, so they're, they're definitely all mentioned on all the, all the various species. Um, we've highlighted various organisations that um, you can look that are supporting these and you can get information on um, about, you know, for instance, fungicide resistance. Um, and as you can see, um, we mention actives, um, but not any product names in keeping with our independence. Um, and we, you know, we do go through and make sure that that information is, you know, is kept up to date. Um, and so then also we provide a lot of information on alternative and cultural control. So that might be weather timings, cultivation, seed rates, insect traps, things like that. Um, and so and you can also see here I've highlighted where we have, um, you know, for instance, using the AHDB recommended list um, to then choose varieties that might um, that would have resistance to Septoria. So that's just an example of how um, how that information is included. And then throughout the information, um, there are links to other organisations and articles. Um, these are in the text, but then also all of those links are put down at the related links at the bottom of each page so that they can be easily found as well. Um, and as you can see, we do use other sources of information. Um, AHDB is used um, quite a lot, or, you know, for instance, um, diseases to do with potatoes, it links to potato um, websites or PGRO, FIPI, that sort of thing. Um, and then we've also got um, a gallery of pictures um, that would help with um, identification and, and uh, so that you can, you can try and match it up for yourself from looking at the, at the information and what you've got in the field. So I mentioned that there was um, some new features that had been added. Um, and so one of these was to add an articles um, section. because so we thought that would be able to share and highlight some interesting topics um, uh, with, with farmers and growers. Um, one of these as an example is a colleague at Rothamsted produces data on light leaf um, spot. So, um, so when, once he'd, he'd sent me a link which had the forecast for that. So um, I can turn that into an article and then also that goes on to you know, put that on Twitter as well. So that information is out there. So then with Crop Protect, um, we're always keeping it up to date, but we would definitely like to do more um, with it. We believe it's got a lot of potential. Um, and so just a, a couple of things that we're thinking about. Um, we think the weeds pages could maybe do with a bit of um, updating, a bit of revamping, just tidying up and making them a bit more um, succinct. Um, always looking you know, for, um, you know, we've got the, got the lists of the different species on there, but it'd be good if we can expand those that are covered. For instance, BYDB is not 
talked about yet on crop protecting of course that's a, an increasing threat so that's something that we need to address and to help us keep to keep up to date and um, to kind of keep the, the communication um, more linked with the between the website and the app and, and with Twitter um, so we are getting the Twitter feed um, integrated into the website and this is um, about to happen imminently um, and so some other ideas that we've thought about as well, um, some, sometimes the choices that are made um, might not be good for um, other species. Um, and so we want to explore this and um, we're going to try, we're looking at a pilot um, for the weeds because we, we've got some good data on the um, the different life cycle of some of the weeds and just to look at whether if doing doing a certain cultural control method for, for one weed species then leads to an increase in the problem of another weed species. So that's that's an idea that we've got. Um, and also wondering about um, you know like a citizen science approach of using crop protect to try and collect data on species, um, for instance wheat diseases, um, aphids relating to BYDV and um, blackgrass, um, particularly we found that highlighted this year with it being also an unusual year and unable for scientists to be able to get out and, and collect data as we usually would have done. Um, and so there's certainly more that we could do with, with Crop Protect, um, for instance as well developing the um, the free account. We think there could be a lot more that we could could do with that as well. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I I really like working with Quack Protect, and I think it's got real potential. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you and um, answer any questions. Hey, Laura. Um, so we have got um, so far. You've only got one question. You're getting off lightly. I'm sure people will post them as we go along and you'll be right back in for the uh, discussion at the end. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is, are vegetable crops included in the app or is it just the main arable crops? Um, yes, so at the moment it is just the, the main arable crops, so the, 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 very, the, the, kind of the common ones of um, wheat barley, beans, potatoes, peas, linseed, I think might be mentioned on there. But yes, that is something that we have um, thought about, about whether we kind of you know, expand into yeah, vegetables or, or you know, other um, horticultural type crops here, you know, especially you know, I suppose bearing in mind that things might be changing over the years and we might need to be um, increasing the crops that we're growing so there's certainly potential for that um yeah and i think i mean yeah the the crops the crops section could you know could maybe do a little bit of a a, a, a relook as well and, and and updating that so uh, and we also have a, another comment of whether it could uh, also incorporate grassland crops so pastures as well oh, okay yes um that's yeah that's a good um yeah definitely a good point that's something that we could yeah could look into um yeah i mean we've i suppose yeah we, we can certainly in in increase in that there's some i think there might be some insects and some um that would that would be towards grassland i can't remember grassland might be included i, I can't remember but yes that's another another area that we could definitely develop um yeah. um so we are going to launch a poll now and um, this is about the uh, crop protect um, who are wanting to collect some seasonal pest species information um, and they'd like a um, some feedback really from you as delegates on on how that would best be collected um, uh, from your point of view um, because obviously crop protect are always trying to um, develop um, and and uh, move onwards into new iterations and collecting that seasonal pest information um, is uh, very useful. So um, trying to uh, discover which would be the best way of collecting that information from farmers, growers, agronomists, um, people working out in the field or, or those with an interest in the uh, agricultural sector. So if you could complete that uh, poll, that would be really useful for uh, Laura and the team at Crop Protect. 
So we we'll just give that another couple of seconds. And um, then I would like to move on to our next presentation. So um, I'd like to be introducing now uh, Leanne Hai Wu um, from Rothamsted Research and Rob Sanders from uh, Glass Data. Um, Rothamsted and uh, Glass Data are collaborating on the VizAg project. Um, and uh, Rob and Leanne Hai are here to talk to you today um, about that. Thank you very much, uh, Kirsty. Um, my name is Leanna Hao from uh, Rosmerstadt. Uh, I just mainly to uh, describe the scientific background of VZAC. Uh, Rob will uh, take over for the interface. Um, I think that since this is a big challenge for scientists, uh, how we can convert our research result uh, for um, uh, farmers for, for clients. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we, I just, I spent the over uh, 20 years to develop uh, uh, the model, uh, the Spexis model. So very, very complicated because these, um, the original um, objective is to serve for the scientific research uh, to become a, a scientific research tool. So this model has been used uh, in various the soil conditions, uh, climate conditions, um, uh, cropping systems, and also used for arable land and, and grassland. To look at the uh, yield um, um, prediction, um, carbon sequestration, uh, water fluxes, uh, uh, and also nutrient budgets. So thanks to the EDF program, so uh, we um, closely work with and uh, collaborate with the glass data. And we're trying to, to um, convert this scientific tool as a um, farmer tool. Uh, so we just will move from, from the, um, the uh, local machine to the uh, cloud, or to become the, uh, the web-based or, or portable uh, uh, tool for farmers. And next slide, please. So as I, uh, I mentioned that you know this model has been used in very um, different uh, situations. So this is the um, output, input from a spectrum. You can see that it's very, very complicated. Uh, it's very hard for farmers to use it. Uh, so possibly uh, consultants can use it. And so we, we needed to simplify these things uh, and then uh, farmers can uh, use it directly. So next slide, please. Right, so uh, we, the, the idea is we have the Spexis model uh, and also has the, um, the database to host the input and output. So really we wanted to get the, date, the useful data from different sources. Uh, here I just highlight the weather and the soil uh, through this simulation interface. Uh, and then uh, through the fluxes, we could the, um, show the results to farmers. So this is the this is testing just the uh, uses the web-based uh, system. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so you can see from the top that's the uh, that's the data for scientific simulation. So we need uh, different to the um, Sense or just a weather, soil uh, management. So this is this is similar to the uh, to the uh, the previous slides, but we will the 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 I uh, the aim is just that we can show the results uh, through the uh, web uh, app or app uh, for the uh, crop management for those applications. Uh, this is um, next slide, please. 
Yeah, so this is the the, um, the, the crops or, or plants. Um, right now, we can uh, include uh, in this the, um, in this app, uh, and also we could have the uh, different cropping systems or rotations uh, to consider different crops or uh, in in a, in a, in a, a rotation cycle. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the input. What did they, we just always simplified the, the original input. So that's farmers can easily to put up. Uh, that's a crop management and fertilizer applications, uh, field management, uh, and the soil information. So for soil information, we can get it from the, um, either from the farmers or from a soil, uh, soil uh, database. We just only ask the very conventional uh, data not so complicated science. So I just stop by here and then hand over to Rob uh, for the um, interfaces. Thanks, Jan. Hi. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? So um, as Jan Hai said, um, the model started off as an academic tool and it's really, really complicated. Um, and it's a really, really powerful tool. Uh, so we wanted to, the whole point of this project was to simplify it and make it accessible um, like throughout the entire industry, but primarily at a farm level. Um, so we at Glass Data, we specialize in connecting different sources of information together, trying to make them all appear ubiquitous, like they've all come from one place, uh, and so that they can communicate with each other. Um, so we're going to be um, embedding the VISAG prediction model into our system um, so that the, a lot of these bits of information, for example, the weather data, will be harvested automatically, put into the model. You'll be able to run the model either over a, a wide area or a specific area, so for example, a single field, um, and then you'll be able to access your results and compare it with, with different things all throughout the system. Um, could we have the next slide, please? So this is what the um, app started out as. So this was the testing system um, when we were, uh, when Roth Hampstead was looking at prototyping how users would actually interact with the model. Um, it's because we wanted to actually move away from typing computer commands and move to a more traditional web-based user interface. Um, if we go to the next one, please. So like I mentioned, we're currently in the process of embedding it into our system. So what we're going to have is a, is a completely separate area where you'll be able to uh, log into an existing account or create an account. And then you'll be taken to a dedicated zone where you'll be asked specific questions about uh, the area that you want to run a simulation on. Um, and then it will run the simulation given your specific use case and, and show you the information. I'm just going to take you through a couple of screenshots now. Uh, as to, to what it's like, but it's, bear in mind it's a, it's a prototype at the moment, so the final version will, uh, will look slightly different. Uh, if we could have the next slide, please. So the simulation collects information on uh, specific things. So here's an example of your soil information. Um, some of this will be able to be automated. Um, our system has a, a mapping module and you can input fields automatically from the Rural Payments Agency. Uh, and the sizes of those fields can come in as well. So in the future, we will be filling in some of these parameters for you automatically. But to start with, um, this will be manually entered uh, when you want to run a simulation. Um, if we could go to the next one, please. Uh, this is again the, the testing um, user interface, uh, again, representing the soil information. <clears throat> and the next slide um, is the fertilizer application, just to give you a flavor of the sort of information that will be required. <clears throat> a lot of these, for example, the fertilizer types, we have a, a huge preset of different types of fertilizer that you'll be able to select from, uh, and then the application method of that as well. So again, just to automate the process a little bit and speed it up. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So once all this information has been input, um, we'll then send it off to the simulation. What we've done, like Ian Hai said, is we've taken this from a a bit of code which runs on someone's PC under the desk. We've stripped it down, we've kind of um, encapsulated it and we're now putting it on the cloud. And what that means in practical terms is that wherever you are, you'll be able to access it um, simply by just logging into a browser. So it's much, much simpler uh, to access. Um, and the output of it is um, predicted yield in terms of, so here you've got the straw and the grains. 
you'll also have um, the grain dry matter, leaf dry matter, stem dry matter, as you can see at the bottom there. And there's also a, a carbon sequestration. Um, so as the prediction of the crop increases, so will the amount of carbon which is being sequestered, which we're going to include uh, in these final results as well. As things like the ELMS uh, trials progress uh, and the new government, government initiatives move away from uh, sort of the production of farming and more into the environmental goods of farming, um, it could well be that things like um, the value or the amount of carbon that you're going to sequester for any given crop could have a, a very significant impact into what crop you then go and plant uh, and when potentially you harvest it as well. Uh, so really the whole point of this is to be a, a decision support tool to aid those, those future decisions. Um, last slide, please. So that was a, quite a quick overview. Um, we'll have more information in the new year with a hopefully all singing or dancing simulation for you to interact with. Um, but for now, any questions, please do give us a shout. So um, you two have got away with it even lighter. There's no questions as yet. <laughs> but as I said, um, delegates, please feel free to um, pose any questions. If you could just add Bizag before your question so we know who to address it to in the panel discussion at the end, um, with, if we get any um, other questions come in. Um, also, um, if you would, um, if you're keen to be involved um, in um, potentially the user testing or um, trialing the VISAG as, as it's under development currently. And we're, as uh, Rob said, we're hoping to um, do a launch of this, um, of this first stage product in the new year. And um, then please do let us know. Um, so uh, we all we have got one question that's come in is when is the website likely to launch? So we've been doing a lot of work recently preparing the, the cloud um, part of it, if you like, which is actually going to be doing the heavy lifting of running the simulation. We're currently now working on the updated website itself. Um, we'll be launching a prototype version later this year with the aim of uh, a couple of months into next year having a more production ready version, which you'll be able to use on any of your fields uh, in your farms. So um, I think we will move on to our next presentation. Oh, hang on. Can you give me any more detail on the carbon sequestration element with particular reference to rotational grazing or rotational grass? So I'm assuming that's rotational grazing. Leon, how do you want to do that one? Yeah, can I answer the question? <clears throat> yes, because in the model, uh, we are similar to the carbon uh, cycling to look to investigate or just the quantify different processes within the system for um, carbon uh, cycling. Uh, so if you have the more uh, or the manure applied, so in that case, will the, the soil carbon pool will be built up. Uh, and also if you just have a grass, it's a grass, uh, grassland, uh, that's the uh, because that's the uh, perennial grasses would have a more carbon uh, contribution um, through the uh, through root system. So that's the gradually build up of the carbon pool. So when you, if, if you convert it to arable land because of different management uh, and applying uh, the uh, the carbon pool will uh, decline gradually. Uh, so that's, yeah, we will look at this sentence. Okay, and as if the delegates knew to give me a segue into the next speaker. So um, thank you, Leanne, hi, and Rob, um, for that um, presentation. As we said, you know, uh, we will keep you posted um, on the developments and we will be looking um, to do a launch event um, in the new year so that you'll get more information on this. Um, but our, I'd like to welcome our next speaker. Um, so I'd like to welcome um, uh, Paul Harris. Um, he'll be talking about the uh, Soil Carbon Project, so very linked to our previous mm -hmm. questions. Um, so I'm sure you're all aware that uh, soil organic carbon is um, very much in the headlines. 
So this is a partnership project between Rothamsted Research, Dutchie College and a Plymouth University. Um, and um, Paul Harris is going to speak to us about that. Uh, he'll be joined um, for the question session by uh, two of the other members of the team as well. So I'll introduce them when they come um, they come on camera. Um, but if you'd like to post any questions about uh, the Soil Carbon Project, please do in the Q&A and we will answer them after the presentation. Thank you. Hello everybody. So um, I'm going to talk about the, the Soil Carbon Project. And it doesn't have a app associated with it or decision support tool, but it can, it can feed in to the VISAG project that you've just heard about, and also the farm carbon cutting um, uh, project that we're going to hear about after this one. So <coughs> potential to link to an app or a decision support tool. <coughs> so the, the Soil Carbon Project. So the project aims has been running since 2018. It's a it's a three year project, and we're, we're trying to understand the relationship between farm management and soil quality, especially soil organic matter and soil carbon. So part of the project, so the project we're gonna we conduct lots of surveys on soil quality across different farm types, and um, we've collected soil samples at different depths, and we've got proxy measures of soil quality. And we're looking at interlab comparis comparisons when we um, uh, put, put the, um, the sort of do the soil analysis. We're also looking at um, best ways to conduct the sampling and optimal sample designs for soil carbon. And we're going to look at the whole farm car carbon footprint, offset its potential, and the, the impact of different uh, management practices. Um, the project consists of three, three um, key groups. It's, it's basically led by Dutchie College and Becky, who you've also already heard from. So, um, so that's the project lead, Dutchie College, um, Becky leading it. And then the Rothamsted component, which I lead, we're, we're mainly about the sample design. So the, the best way to sample for uh, soil carbon on farm. And then the Plymouth um, side of the project, that's the interlab comparisons of when you sort of um, when you're measuring uh, the soil carbon and different ways it can be processed through the lab. Uh, here's our business output. So we got so we're doing quite well with different um, MEs and stuff. So that's just a, a list of the um, business outputs that we've got. Um, uh, so. There's actually a network of 60 farms across England, but we're, we're just, because this is um, uh, a Cornwall, Cornwall project, we're just focused on 35 farms in Cornwall. So what we do, we sample three to five fields per farm uh, across a range of enterprises, soils and management. So we've got 35 farms in Cornwall that we can, um, we can um, collect data from. Um, so year one, we collected them um, uh, soils on soil organic matter at different depths, uh, just using the um, the standard W protocol. So that's just say uh, 15 points, and then you then you bulk those 15 samples. And we also measured loss of ignition, bulk density, soil nutrients, and we all, importantly we always know the management of those fields across the last five years. And then in year two, uh, we're doing the same again. That's just a broad sweep of soil organic carbon in year one and year two across across fields, but no no within field variability in that respect. Um, also collecting some proxy measures of soil health. So we've got this um, visual evaluation of soil structure, um, aggregate stability, infiltration tests, and earthworm counts. So that's all useful. Uh, contextual data for soil health in addition to soil organic matter and, and soil organic carbon. All very important to build up a picture of the, of the how healthy your soils are. <coughs> so um, uh, the data collection, we did um, 2018 data that's all collected, um, gone through the lab and processed. Uh, 2019 data of course collected but um, some of the lab work uh, the lab work isn't complete and then we've collected data this year um, 
COVID-19 aside, so it's been a bit of a challenge, but it's generally okay. But in this year, we haven't just done the debuts. <clears throat> so throughout the three years, we've been doing debut sampling, which is um, boat, uh, debut sampling unboat, and also high resolution sampling, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. So we can capture the within field variability of soil carbon. Um, collecting data on the field management. So <clears throat> we've been compiling that and that's, I think that's just about done actually, that's finished. We're gonna carbon footprint of the farms. And then we've got to look at the relationships between the field management and the soil quality data. Actually, let's, let's do the statistical analysis. That's, that's actually my job, I'm a statistician. And then we're gonna do some interlab comparison work and engage with more businesses. So the key outputs of this project, we're gonna have a full report done by the end of this year a guide to soil carbon monitoring. And then because of the little bit of delay on the more um, uh, technical stuff and the high resolution data, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, there's gonna be a supplementary technical report on soil carbon sampling, say mid, say June next year. Right, this, so this, now I'm gonna focus on the rough instead um, component of the project. Um, <clears throat> So that's the, that's the general um, component of the project. And Rothenstead has just been, has been more focused. So we've only looked at seven of the 35 farms. We've only looked at 17 fields, but we've done more intensive sampling. So we've got, um, it's, this is the debut sampling here. Hope you, hopefully you can see my mouse moving across the screen. And then, so we've got a, we, we take a boat debut. Um, so we, 15 samples and put it, put it all in one bag. And then we do a non-boat debut as 15 samples but in 15 separate bags and 15 separate analyses. Then we also <coughs> look at gridded data of about 80 to 100 samples per field. <coughs> and then we're doing that in 2018, 2019 and 2020. We've also got one field that we, that we visit every month and do the same sampling. We'll just do the gridded sampling because you can always get the debut from the grid, from the gridded sampling. And we're collecting data on uh, soil organic matter, soil organic carbon, total carbon, bulk density. We always have, this, and we have the farm survey data, as, as radical and contextual data, and also um, the environmental and other contextual data like general uh, uh, weather patterns, uh, topography, elevation, and then um, land use, land type, soil type. So as much contextual data as possible. <coughs> So we've got surveys in Cornwall. So that's seven farms in Cornwall. We've also got some surveys in Niles of Scilly. And we're also combining this data set with um, data from the Norfolk Farm Platform, which is in Cornwall, but in Devon. Uh, so we've got two, data, got two data types. We've got the first type, which is the spatial at different resolutions across seven farms and seven fields. So we've got the boat data. So if we mapped the boat data, it would just actually give us one value of the means. It's just, just a simple, even though there's 15 samples, we've only got one average from that boat data. And then we've got um, non-boat data, which gives an, a, a bit of an idea of the variability of soil organic matter across the 17 fields. And then we've got the gridded data. So we're just gonna look at the data from 2018, because this, this is the only data that's so far been processed. <coughs> And we're going to relate this data. We're going to try and find the best way to do this, um, the monitoring according to these data sets, plus all the contextual data sets that we have. Because there'll be different <coughs> types of monitoring according to management practices of that particular farm or field. All right, just as the first sort of snapshot of what differences you can get. So this, so this is our 17 fields. Um, the green, the green lines, green um, rectangles, are the means of the gridded data. So that's the high resolution data. So that's the, that's the, that's the average of about 80 samples. And the blue lines are just the, are the means of the unboked uh, Ws. And then the red, red lines or rectangles are the means or just the values from the bulk Ws for the 17 fields. And then the box plot behind are actually the values from the gridded, the um, samples about 80 to 100. So 
in general, the, the, the different averages that you've calculated according to the, the resolution of the data that you've collected are broadly similar, but there are, there are quite differences. And sometimes you'll, you'll overestimate or underestimate your soil organic matter just, just due to the way that you've sampled the field. So if we take an example um, here, they're quite different. So the blue and green are quite the same. So uh, the, in, the, in this case, the, the, the boat one is very similar to the gridded one. So that, you know, <coughs> taking the uh, boat one, which is the simplest and easiest one to do, would have been perfectly okay to capture the mean of that field. <coughs> in that instance, um, let's see when it isn't. So this one here, they're quite different. Um, high resolution one is quite a different, quite a lower, lower um, soil organic matter than what would have been done by the boat one. So in in that case, in that instance, assuming that the high resolution data set is is your true one, is your be best estimate, <coughs> then you would have overestimated your soil organic matter in that field simply because the W that you took probably just didn't cover the complete. Um, Spatial, uh, spatial resolution of that, of the, of that field, it, it missed um, areas of quite low soil organic matter. <clears throat> so, what, so this is the information you get from um, the different methods you can use. So if you get, if you just do the W, w sampling and you bulk it, you can only get a good estimate of the mean, which is the average. If you do a debut and you don't bulk it, you can get a you can get the estimate of the mean plus an estimate of the, uh, an estimate of the variability in your soil organic matter. And then if you do a gridded, you, you get the mean and variance again, but you also get an idea of the spatial mean and the spatial variance. So information becomes stronger, of course, the more data you collect. Here's just an example of a field that we sampled for. This is the grid of data, so it's about 80 samples. Here we've interpolated it using um, uh, geostatistics, a method called Krieging. So we smoothed this data to get a, a representation, representation, representation here of the data spatial representation. So there's lower soil organic matter here in the green area and higher in the, in the orange and whiter areas. Importantly, that's just a, a smoothing of this data here. We need to understand the uncertainty of that um, spatial interpolation. And this is the uncertainty map. So there's high uncertainty in soil organic matter in your predictions around here. If you look back at this map, your sample got some high values with some very low values. So this area here has got high spatial variation in soil organic matter. And that's reflected in the uncertainty of these predictions. So <clears throat> as part of what we're going to do here, we want to sort of have guidelines the best ways to sample. So just an example of these sort of um, algorithms we can apply. So here is just an example of like, say we, we, we can only afford to take 15 samples and according, because we've got information, this high resolution information here, you know, what, what would have been the best fifth where would have been the best 15 locations to have sampled from so we can use this information and, and a bit of um, uh, statistics uh, spatial statistics to optimally locate 15 samples so we use this information plus this information and the, and the best places that we could have sam sampled if we only had resources to take 15 measurements would have been these blue stars we won't go into the details this is just one aspect and this is just for one year the actual when we got the three years worth of data and all the management the designs will be a bit bit more involved um so these are the uh, the best 15 places we could have sampled from and if we looked at our debut that we actually did collect it's quite different to where the optimal one was but of course we don't know that at the time but if we start to understand a field's soil organic matter or its management we can come up with good reasonably judged designs for the um, the monitoring of soil organic matter in any field on, the, on a given farm. So yeah, we've still got things to do, but once we once we've um, 
um, got all the data that's in, we'll, have, uh, we'll be better informed, and we can provide guidance to soil sampling, like when and when not to bulk, and um, what's the best sample configuration, how, may, how much to take, how often should we do the sampling. You know, often it will just be taking bulk samples, but sometimes if a change in management has occurred, then it may be worthwhile doing a high resolution grid, a, a good understanding of soil, go back to then, and then in future years you just go back to bulk. And what about depth? And also what about what contextual information is most useful to inform these um, sampling designs? And then there's possibility of it going into a, a an, an app like we've had with um, Vizag um, in the previous presentation. And then you can look at the economic relevance of, of actually getting your, your estimates right and getting them wrong, you know, how much you're going to lose or how much you're going to gain by um, uh, getting your soil organic matter predictions, your field predictions, and the uncertainty on those predictions as best you can. And just, just the final three slides, just about the sort of data that we're getting. Um, this first map's an example, of like, you know, even though we collect there's 25 points in there, there's not actually enough points to, um, to ascertain the sort of spatial variation within that field. We just got to leave them as this. So it's basically all we're getting there is random variation. And then, so there's not enough data in that one. In here, we hopefully there is enough data, but it's still quite random. There's no sort of clear spatial structure to that, to the soil organic, organic matter in that field. So it's, it's a great challenge. It's not just, it's not just um, collecting as much data as possible. So it's, it's collecting the, um, an efficient amount of data, the relevant data. And then this is a quite common pattern. So we're just getting broad trends in soil organic matter across the field. It's probably associated with topography elevation. So you're going from high to low across up and down different fields. So this is all high res you know, reasonably high resolution data. And then the third sort that we tend to get is that this clear pattern variation in soil organic matter across the fields where we're seeing areas of high and low, but very, very distinct areas. And there's probably a good reason why that happens and the, 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 and the farmer would, of course, know. <laughs> but that's all got related. All these, on their own, these make no sense at all. They got related to um, um, the management practice, what's been in the field and what's um, over the last five years and stuff and all the, all the other contextual data. Uh, so that's it. So thank you very much, Harry, for running through um, the soil carbon project um, and particularly the Rotten Z work. So uh, we have uh, one question so far um, of when will the complete results be available for this project? Uh, hopefully June, middle of June next year. Okay. So we're hoping that the initial report um, will be available at the end of this year? Yeah, so you get, you'll get the initial report at the end of this year, but then the, the supplementary report with all the within field stuff will be June next year, because we haven't um, processed all the data yet. Um, so I will just quickly introduce here the other members of the team. So this is Andy Neal, um, who's part of the Soil Carbon um, Project and is a, a soil microbiologist. And we have um, Will Razy here, who is um, our soil um, sampling expert, who is out in the field and collecting those samples. Um, i just give it a little moment more to see if any more questions will come in. Um, as I've said before on the other speakers, if you have questions that then uh, occur to you while the next speaker is um, on, please post them in the Q&A and uh, just put a, a soil carbon project title and we can uh, cover those at the end of the event. If not, Andy and Will have got away with this very lightly, just appearing and waving and looking pretty. And then... <laughs> Um, and I will, um, I think we will move on to our last speaker. So um, our next speaker 
is um, Becky Wilson, who you have met at the beginning of this. Um, so Becky, uh, I would say that she wears two hats, but she wears a myriad of hats. And um, so she will be speaking um, now about the uh, farm carbon accounting, and she is representing the uh, farm carbon cutting toolkit. Um, and uh, I will leave it to you, Becky. But uh, just to remind you, everybody, any questions, please remember to put them in the Q&A function. And we'll speak to Becky after the presentation. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Kirsty. And yeah, nice to nice to be back on. Um, I say wearing a slightly different hat this time. Um, I say I'm, I'm a research lead at Dutchie College, but I also uh, project manage the Farm Carbon Toolkit. Um, so yeah, this this last session of the of the afternoon is really going to be looking at how we can use some of the data that's been discussed uh, discussed in the various different presentations today, both from looking at uh, a manure management point of view, looking at soils data, looking at fertilizer data, looking at uh, carbon data, and how we can put all that together really um, and other farm farm levels of information that we need in order to use this information to do carbon accounting. Thank you Sophie. Um, so the Farm Carbon Toolkit is a farmer-led organisation. Um, it was set up back in 2009 and as I say our, our USP really is that all of our directors are, are full-time farmers and then I help out with delivering the projects. Um, and the real aim of the organisation is to encourage and support farmers and growers um, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, improve energy resilience, improve soil health, but ultimately with the aim of improving business resilience for the future. And we do that by providing practical tools and resources that farmers can use to help understand uh, their impact on greenhouse gas emissions and what they can do differently in terms of managing both emissions and sequestration opportunities. Thanks Sophie. So the thing I'm going to talk to you about today is our carbon calculator. And this idea of carbon accounting is becoming, uh, you know, more and more up the up the sort of uh, agenda in terms of what we're doing at the moment. And you'll be glad to know that I'm not going to spend the next 10 minutes, uh, you know, recounting all the different bits of legislation and all that sort of thing. And the, the journey that we've been on in terms of getting to the position we are now, uh, in terms of there's quite a lot of scrutiny and attention on agriculture's environmental impact and specifically on their carbon footprint. But if we look at how we can use the tools that are out there in terms of carbon footprinting software to help inform management decisions, it actually is that first vital step in being able to contribute, quantify the contribution that an individual farm is making both to climate change, but also in terms of sources of emissions and sequestration. And although carbon footprinting is, you know, is, is sort of quite a, a well used uh, and often, often cited term, put simply, all it really does is try and identify the amount and the source of those three different gases that agriculture is emitting in terms of carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide that are emitted from the farm and then highlights areas where management changes or improvements in practice might be made that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It also allows you to understand current carbon sequestration and offsetting options. So the current carbon that's being stored in woody biomass or on soils on the farm and where you might be able to alter management practice to improve that sequestration potential. And look, it gives you an opportunity to evaluate future projects. It allows you to become more aware and make more informed decisions. So when you're looking at what those strategic things you might be doing for the, you know, for your farm in the long term, you can start to evaluate the carbon, uh, the carbon impact on those as well as, as well as the financial and other environmental outputs impact. But those metrics that are used need to be relevant, so they need to make sense to your business. They need to be practical, so they need to be asking the right sort of questions that allow you to actually take account truly of what's happening in terms of management. They need to be consistent, and consistency is something that we've had issues with in the past in terms of different calculators pro providing different results. It's something that we really need to focus on moving forward in terms of delivering those consistent metrics. But they're also that first point in terms of informing behavioural change. So the idea of a carbon accounting tool is not that it's such a hideous process to do that by the time you finished, you have to go and lie down in a darkened room for three weeks and you want to throw the computer out the window. The idea is that the carbon footprint process is actually that first step in being able to then say, well, what does this mean and what can I use this information for in terms of being able to inform my future management? Thanks, Sophie. And here we also can start to see one of the issues that we have with carbon. There's a couple of a couple of issues when we start talking about how we communicate the whole area of carbon and climate change. Now, 
all of the language around this sort of topic is around carbon. We're talking about net zero carbon, carbon footprinting and all that sort of stuff. But for agriculture, we're not just dealing with carbon or carbon dioxide. We're also dealing with, with, with other gases as well in terms of nitrous oxide and methane. So that's one of the first things we have to look at. The other thing that we have to look at is that although carbon footprints are really useful in terms of an environmental and economic uh, you know, auditing tool, carbon can be really difficult to visualise. Um, and understand what, what's happening. We can't see these emissions being emitted, just like we can't see carbon being pulled in. And actually it's quite difficult to understand what a ton of carbon dioxide or a carbon dioxide equivalent looks like in terms of how much volume it would take up. And so it can be really, it can be really difficult sometimes to when you get through a carbon audit or you start looking at it to understand what those values mean in terms of whether they're a good thing or a bad thing. And so one of the other things that we really try and do is try and help contextualize carbon and actually turn it into something which makes sense to farmers. So looking at the comparison footprints of different commodities that you might use on the farm or starting to look at comparing uh, what you might need to do in terms of sequestration to offset, offset a certain emission. So all of these things really make it a lot easier in terms of trying to understand how carbon flows through your business. Thanks, Sophie. We OK, brilliant. So our calculator, um, as I say, is one of the core tools that we have within the business. Um, it follows the same USP in terms of it's been developed by farmers for farmers. So hopefully it's quite practical and, and definitely has been developed from a sort of bottom up approach. It's completely free for farmers to use. And once you've logged on and created an account, you can create as many different reports as you like. You can sit there doing it, you know, from now until Christmas. Uh, you know, if, if the sort of uh, impending lockdown means that you have a bit more time on your hands, you can scenario plan to your heart's content. So there's no limit in terms of the number of reports that you can do. It accounts for soil carbon sequestration and the way that it currently does that is on a measurement based approach. But as Paul was just saying, in terms of uh, what's going on, we're hoping that the research that comes out of the soil carbon project will allow us to uh, populate a model based approach that sits behind the calculator for those people that don't have um, those figures in terms of, uh, you know, two, two consecutive time points, which you've done soil analysis, you'll be able to use a sort of model or a practice based approach. It allows you to monitor the footprint annually. So ideally, as I say, the process is not so hideous that you never do it again and you see the value and you come back and you do it on a yearly basis. So then you can actually start to see the impact and see what's happening in terms of, uh, you know, which, what's happening with emissions reductions or sequestration and really start to be able to benchmark against yourself um, and document your progress. It provides the footprint as a carbon dioxide equivalent. So taking those three gases, carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide and translating them into a carbon dioxide equivalent. But within that, you can actually see the different greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see where the methane is being emitted and where the nitrous oxide is emitted. It also includes the new methane methodology. So following on from the work that's been done at Oxford, looking at the, the development of the new GWP star metric, so looking at the fact that methane behaves slightly differently to carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, um, that's all included within the methodology so that you can model your results using the traditional way of measuring methane, where it's sort of 30 times more potent, but you can also look at the impact of the new GWP star. And we launched a new reporting format, thanks to funding from Agritech Cornwall. Uh, the calculator was updated and was launched back uh, at the Oxford Farming Conference in January. Thanks, next slide, please. So in terms of the stages to calculate your carbon footprint, there's various things that you need to go through. So you need to log on to the system. You need to create an account. That account is then there for you. That information doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't fly off to DEFRA or anybody like that. It's there literally for you to use, uh, to use in terms of creating your reports. You have to collect your data first, and this is the stage which can be quite painful. Um, as you can see from the tabs that you can see there, there's quite a lot of categories that that information needs to go into. Because the tool actually allows you to assess the impact of your management, there's quite a lot of uh, data that needs to go in at the front end. Um, and you can see that then you can work your way through the different sections and then you get your results at the end. Thank you. Next slide, please, Sophie. Um, but what you tend to find Oh, sorry, go back one. Thank you. Is that people spend a lot of time focusing on the data collection, um, which is actually the, the quite boring bit of it, even for a shadow like me that does this all the time. You know, that's the quite boring part of the thing, putting the information in, collecting the information and putting it in. And so 
and we, we spend a lot of time focusing on that bit and less time focusing on the exciting bit, which is the results. So it's our carbon balance and it's about exploring those results to see what they mean for our business. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so interpreting results is a key part and you can start looking at those results and breaking those results down into different sections. So you can see the headline result there. And again, we hit another one of the, the intricacies of carbon accounting and not a minus number there is a good thing uh, rather than a negative, rather than a bad thing. You can then start to look at what that means in terms of emissions in summary categories. So how your emissions are broken out in terms of percentage from different categories. You can also then get in, in information in terms of each individual uh, input there. And you also then links into our toolkit. So you can then say, well, what can I actually do to reduce this emission? Thank you. So interpreting results is a key part of it. As I say, the sort of data entry is something that you need to get through in order to get to the really interesting bit. It allows you to evaluate where you are currently. It puts that line in the sand of this is where we are now, and we can now use this as a springboard to look at what we can do in the future. It gives you that baseline. It allows you to be more informed, and it gives you that evidence in terms of being able to change your management. Thank you. The other thing you can use the tool for is that we have a scenario testing capability. So once you've put your baseline information in for the first time, you can then start to use that information to look at what if scenarios. So what would the impact be if I managed to cut my fuel use by 10%? What would the impact be if I changed from winter to spring cropping? If I started to incorporate cover crops? If I changed my grazing management strategy, like somebody was saying earlier, if I moved from a set stock to a rotational grazing strategy, what would that do in terms of my emissions? And all of that can be done within the tool in terms of looking at uh, developing different what if and scenario testing and this is all really really hopefully easy to use and allows you to evaluate the impact of management before you start thank you so just to conclude then um, you know carbon calculators are a tool um, they're a tool that allow you to sort of almost put that line in the sand and look at how your farm is performing currently and baseline that current position. That then gives you a starting point to be able to understand the scale of your individual challenge to potentially reach net zero or do any of those other things that policy is encouraging us to do at the moment. But from an individual farm perspective, it's also just a different way of looking at business efficiency. There's a really, really good link between reduction in carbon footprint and also improved use of resources and reduction in costs. So if nothing else, that's the really first place to focus on. It's really important to have an understanding of the background of the carbon calculator that you're using. There are about four or five that are out there that are, you know, are used quite widely. Understand what your carbon calculator includes and doesn't and find the one that works for you and some of that comes down to understanding well what do you actually want the results for are you looking to sort of understand the impact of management or are you looking for a sort of marketing uh, marketing or, or business development opportunity but it's also important to remember that none of them are perfect this whole area is an evolving science um, but we really have to start somewhere so all of these calculators will get better as the research is, is fed through as we get more iterative understanding of emissions factors and all that sort of things these calculators will get better but we can't wait for them with the you know the sort of uh, scale of issues we've got around the climate crisis and other things we can't wait for them to be wait for them to be perfect now we have to start now Thank you very much. I think that's probably the, there's probably just one more slide, but that's it. Thank you. So, um, thank you very much, Becky. Um, another great presentation. Um, so we have uh, one question here. Where can we find out the CO2 equivalents for agricultural commodities and agricultural supplies and services so that they can compare and contrast? Um, so the, depending on what you're talking about there, I mean, I think in terms of sort of average, average footprints in terms of CO2 equivalent for different commodities, that 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 does exist. Um, I say there's some of some work that's been done by by AHDB and others. I mean, we certainly have sort of benchmarking within our tool in terms of looking at where you are compared to compared to sort of the rest of the cohort of farmers that are in there. Um, I think it's it's it can be quite a tricky thing to do. Uh, in terms of getting that because there are so many different production systems and all of those things in terms of how you produce these things has an impact in terms of what that footprint has so it you know it's difficult I mean in terms of in terms of the emissions factors we have those as I say which are produced by uh, you know a sort of a group of scientists I'm sure some of them are from Northwick in terms of you know creating those creating those emissions factors that go into the back end of the calculator and then it's about looking at the input data from the farmer and then you know multiplying those by the emissions factor which shows how 
how much of each of those greenhouse gases is is provided by by, by an input commodity. Um, but in terms of those sort of broad baselines, in terms of you know a ton of wheat produces X tons, um, certainly some of that work was done um, done back in terms of looking at uh, you know when if you look sort of go back in terms of some of the research that was looking at the carbon footprint of different products, um, you know, and there's been some comparisons in terms of carbon footprint of beef versus vegetables and all that sort of stuff and looking around dietary choice. But actually, if you start to look at what sits behind those, um, you know, again, some of those potentially aren't UK specific, they're using global numbers. And this is where we start to get into the nitty gritty. And there's a real mm. issue with this. And when we start communicating about carbon is the fact that we, you know, there's these very broad brush statements that are put out there. And it, it's really true that the devil is in the detail. Um, and so an understanding of what's going on on an individual farm really allows you to take account of what you're doing. Um, and yes, as I say, potentially then it's good to good to compare to those global figures. But certainly, um, you know, certainly it can be misleading, especially when we start trying to talk to consumers about this sort of stuff. Um, so next question is, do you think there are KPI carbon for different enterprises? Yeah. Yeah, there are, and and it's certainly something that we are um, we are looking to include both in terms of um, in terms of benchmarking. So we currently do a little bit of benchmarking. So once you get to the end, you can see how you compare um, to other farms within your within your sector. And as the tools evolved, we've had to you know wait till we've got a good uh, a good sort of number of farmers that are that are using the tool that we can actually start to generate those benchmarks. But the the next stage really um, in terms of the holy grail is being able to really connect up those carbon benchmarks and those carbon KPIs with other economic KPIs and we can see you know we can see that 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 exists um, so actually being able to show that you know if you can you know improve your carbon percentage if you can start to you know improve your grass management then actually you're not only getting a getting an economic benefit you're also getting environmental benefit and you're also getting a carbon benefit and being able to really stack those win-wins allows us to really start to strengthen the evidence behind some of those management practices as we start to tr transition to a to a more sustainable uh, and resilient resilient industry. That's great. So um, we are going to go on to our last poll, uh, which is just really to find out if um, if the delegates are currently using decision support tools, if you use them, and, and applications, if you're using them all of the time, uh, sometimes or not at all. Um, then uh, we'd really like to get an idea and an overview. This also gives you another few moments to add any uh, additional questions that you would like to ask to any specific speaker or to um, all of our speakers today as they're all going to now uh, rejoin us as a panel. Um, so if you have any questions, any general uh, questions about, um, about the support tools, or um, applications or the conversion of data into pharma uh, interfaces, then uh, please paste them now uh, in the Q&A function. And then uh, we'll just give it another couple of moments for, uh, for the uh, poll to be completed. And then I will welcome back all of our speakers. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, so thank you everyone for uh, rejoining. So we had a couple of questions that came in um, after uh, the Q&A sessions. So the first one was for the uh, CRAP app for um, Becky and Rob, um, asking if the CRAP app takes into account grazing livestock down um, in its uh, sort of application uh, recommendations. Um so in terms of what's deposited on the field so it's take it's taking into account you can you can specify whether you're um whether you're grazing or cutting your grassland um but it's it's what it's looking at is it's looking at um applications that are put, you're putting on so if you're spreading manure or slurry or if you're um, applying it out of a bag if you've got animals that are already grazing on that pasture then no it's not taking account what's happening there um it's looking at what that what that crop requires you can then you can it's something that we could we could add in in terms of uh, in terms of in the future, but it doesn't it doesn't currently take account what the animals themselves are depositing on the pastures. It's more looking at you know total crop requirements um, and then what each spreading event that you're putting on is applying and then deducting that from the from the total crop requirements. 
Okay, and we have a question for the soil carbon team. So um, Paul and Andy and Will. Um, from your work to date and any gut feeling, do you think payments for carbon sequestration is realistic over a short term period or will it need to be trends over many years? And Becky can also chip in because one of her hats is soil carbon too. Andy? My, my gut instinct that is well, that it will be trends over many years. Um, what we've done suggests that this it could be decades before you see any significant changes. Um, so it's not clear how that will be done on an instantaneous basis. Um, so I can't, I think it will be very difficult to pay for carbon from one year to the next because it will be very difficult to measure changes. It's going to have to be something over a longer term. And I, th I think it's just just sort of carrying on from that. I think it's important to to understand that that noise that happens during the year. I mean, we've got some some fields that we've been measuring every month uh, to understand that difference within the year, and also ones you know the ones that we've been measuring every year. And sometimes it can fluctuate and be quite be quite up and downy. And what you don't what you as as Andy says, you're trying to look at those long term trends rather than that sort of quite immediate noise. And so making sure that we've got an optimal sampling frequency uh, in terms of how many you know time between years and certainly what we've been doing at soil carbon project um certainly from our side it's probably been a bit too frequent so it can confuse farmers but actually in the long term i think you know minimum sort of three to five years in terms of that looking at what's happening um but what we have found with the proxy indicators is that we found some good relationships between aggregate stability and carbon so you could potentially use that as a proxy indicator as to whether your soils are transitioning in the right direction in between those lab samples I, I would I would also add this is this actually is a really interesting question to me, uh, but it, it's really complicated because um, a lot of so well all soils will eventually achieve some maximum carbon that they can they can hold, and so if you, if you're already managing your soil in a particularly good way and you're at that threshold, um, I feel you should be rewarded for that. But um, we've got to be really careful that the, the way this is calculated and paid for means that because you're not able to sequester any more carbon in that soil, that you, you effectively get penalized because of that. So there are, I think there are a lot of very difficult, but very um, you know, practically meaningful problems to um, how farmers are being asked to manage carbon in their soils that have no simple answers at the moment. I, I, I think that, that we, yeah, sorry, go Rob. No, I can add to the question and just say, would an immediate payment system not be set up around something like uh, borders where there was uh, arable land, perhaps a border of a particularly carbon sequestering crop? Um, and that kind of potentially, and what we've seen with our trials and elms is that that kind of strategy might translate into payments within the first year if you're seen to be doing that. But that's sort of trusting that the carbon's going in, right? No. And, <laughs> and I'm not saying it isn't, but um, th I think that's a different sort of strategy to some extent. And I, and I think I think we, we go back to the question in terms of do we pay by practice or do we pay by measurement? And I think, you know, carrying on from what Andy was saying, I, I sort of envisage the future that we have a two, we have two different, two completely separate sets of payments. We have one that, as Andy says, pays for the carbon that's already stored there so that we're not losing more up to the atmosphere. Um, and then for those farmers that potentially are starting from a lower baseline or potentially are doing those doing those management practices that are able to pull in more carbon, then that's a potentially tradable asset which might sit outside of any potential elms and the elms potentially might look at, at doing that carbon protection payment. Because what we also don't want to do is be massively focused on gains and not and not look at, you know, as I say, looking after the carbon that we've already got. So actually, you know, that the easiest way to, to pull in additional carbon sequestration is to go and plough up all of our old, uh, you know, all of our old permanent pastures and all those sort of things release it all back up and then capture it back down again you know we don't want to be doing that because actually you know and if you're just chasing a sort of payment for gain then you know that you're, you're more at risk of having that so i think we've got to protect the carbon that we've already got and then potentially look at you know diversifying um business opportunities in terms of that tradable asset for changing practice as rob said and, and looking at looking at what those practices are that can start to build carbon and then how we look after that additional level as well and livestock farmers have a really valuable carbon carbon to trade in in the form of manures. 
Um, and if many of their soils are already at maximum carbon, the way they can really get added value is with sharing that or trading it, ideally, with farmers that desperately need that carbon. So I think they're a, an interesting source of headed income if we could persuade someone to pay for shit, but there we are. <laughs> Andy. Um, <Hello>? So <laughs> the next question is, um, if we took our full knowledge of carbon sequestration of 100%, what number do you think we're at now? Mm. What a great question. I think I we're know. above 50. Above 50. I think Any we're above 50. Uh, and cer certainly what we found through this project is every time we think we've cracked something, we realise that we're back at the bottom again. So, uh, <laughs> so every, you know, every time we, we think that we've, we've got something sorted, something, and, and that's the, that's the fun of, of, of working in this area in terms of that system based, you know, as, as all farmers are having to do in terms of taking account of, you know, climatic conditions, taking account cropping management and all the rest of it. But I would probably echo what Andy's saying. I think we're probably, maybe I'm a bit, a bit, more pessimistic I think we're probably about 45 percent because I think a bit like soil biology when we you know we're learning as we go along aren't we and actually you know we know more about what's on the surface of the moon than what's under our feet and actually there's so much more to learn uh, in terms of in terms of you know I think I think we're, we're taking great steps in terms of being able to understand how we test for it but in terms of all the different interactions of everything that's happening at a systems level I think we've still got a long way to go I'd be more optimistic <laughs> And, but, but I do think that carbon is the main way into understanding how soil works. Um, without carbon, it's not soil anymore. So uh, we don't understand it yet, but I think we're all very much agreed that carbon is an integral part of soil. And the getting of so carbon into soil is only going to bring positive outcomes. Okay, so we have a question that kind of links all of those previous ones in that it's um, looking at as though elms will want to include carbon sequestration as a public good once it gets going. How long before we have the research tools or the results to feed into this? Well, as I say, I'm happy to go again unless anybody else wants to go. Um, yeah. But just I think, you know, I think I think we are we are taking great steps forward. And I think the great thing with Soil Carbon Project is that we're doing it out on farm. So I think there is there is a huge amount of scope and um, opportunity to use the the fantastic modelling that, that Harry's doing and others in terms of looking at how we can take that take that data from farm but I think the nice thing with uh, with this project is that as I say we're also uh, we're also doing it out out in the out in the real world as it were where you know where everything everything's up for up for changing and all the rest of it um, I think I think we we have it's a bit like carbon footprinting I think we we have to start somewhere and I don't think we'll we'll start you know elms payments with the with the finalized system or the finalized product but unless we start somewhere we're going to miss out on the opportunities and we're not going to achieve either our our, our, you know, our emission reduction targets or our improved soil health aspirations. So I, I think it's going to evolve as we go along. Um, I think there might be, a, there will be a few, a few teething pro problems. And I think there are, you know, there is a huge, uh, a huge need for both, you know, uh, work like we're doing in the soil carbon project, but also linking that up with the work that Harry's doing in terms of how we can take that that data that we're collecting out on farms and then scale that up and look at um, you know look at what that can provide in terms of looking at looking at things that work across different parameters and all those other sort of things which which models are very good at being able to, to do. I'll just add to that quickly um, we were involved in one of the tests to do with ELMS um, and what we first were tasked to do is to form a baseline of what information was available because it's still quite early stages and they're not entirely sure exactly how they're going to measure and what they're going to measure in order to you know what is environmental good and how they're going to measure that and what became clear quite quickly was that out of all the trials going on around the UK um, there was not a single way that everybody was doing it differently so um, it's still very much under consideration exactly what shape it's going to take it's clear that it will involve carbon in some way 
uh, and it will be, have a heavy focus on environmental good. But apart from that, you know, the practicalities of it are still out of touch. Um, so I'm sure we're going to hear more about that relatively soon. And like Becky said, it will be a simple version to begin with that then probably evolves over the years. Something maybe like the high level stewardship schemes, which are currently in place. Um, but uh, in terms of what it is, uh, we, we just don't know yet. Right, so that's all of our questions that have come in. As I suspected, soil carbon would take the limelight. Um, so um, I would just like to take this opportunity to thank um, our presenters today. So a um, big thank you to Robert Dunn, Becky Wilson, Laura Crook, Leanne Hai Wu, Rob Sanders, Paul Harris, Andy Neal and Will Raisey. Um, and also a massive thank you to Sophie Rapson and Gareth Lawless for their invaluable help behind the scenes today. Uh, you haven't seen them, but they have been, uh, they have been controlling everything. Um, as I said before, we'll be sending a follow-up email and feedback opportunity to all delegates, and the recording will be available for, by following the original registration link. And we will also be forwarding a Q&A document. So all the questions that were asked today and their answers, we will forward. And from a delegate suggestion, we'll also include in that a list of links to the projects and apps and tools so that you can, um, you can go and check them out yourself as well. So thank you to everyone for attending. And we hope we see you at future webinars soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.